Okay, so lecture 18. Um, today we're going to talk exclusively about capacitor, which is one of the most important elements in modern electronics. Um, so capacitor um, is something that we use to store charge. And we're going to use that for um, many purposes. But unfortunately, in this class, we're going to learn only you know, like the, the basic functioning of the capacitor. Um, so how it's used actually, I think in my opinion, much more interesting. But um, I'll mention a little bit, probably next lecture, but um, not too much because that's gonna be too deep into, you know, like circuit analysis or something like that. But um, before we talk about capacitor, we need to review a little bit about what we talked about last time, which is um, electric potential and electric potential energy. And I will talk about one specific example to show you how it's connected to you know, some of the things that you knew already from the first semester, which is um, conservation of energy. Okay, so the question that I set up is going to be like this. So this is going to be an example. And I will have always some charge plus Q like this. And I will make this one to not move, essentially fix in space. Okay, it means that we don't need to care about the movement of this charge. So you can think of this as like a very massive um, particle, like maybe, um, you know, a very heavy nucleus or something like that. But doesn't matter, we just fix it. And um, what we're going to calculate is this. So let's assume that Initially, we have another charge, which is this green one. And let's say this is an electron. Okay. Once you know it's an electron, you know the mass and you know the charge, which is negative D. But if you want to be a little bit more generic, you can say, okay, this is just some negative charge with some mass given by little m here. Okay, so what do we want to calculate? So let's assume that initially the electron is a distance r1 away from plus q. This is the initial position. And let's say initially the velocity of this guy is zero. So it's starting from rest. And then you let the system evolve. What's going to happen? Well, you all know that because this is positive charge, this is negative charge, they're going to attract each other. So when you wait a little bit more, then this one will move closer to the charge plus Q. So let's say at some moment in time later, the charge the electron is now here, which is a little bit closer. So now the distance is R2 instead of R1. And it should be clear to you that R2 is smaller than R1, so it's become closer, like this. And then, obviously, at this point, the object, or the electron, will not have velocity equal to zero because it's moving, it's being attracted by this plus Q. Our question is, what is, what is velocity? What is V at R2? That's the um, question we want to answer. Okay, so what is the velocity at R2? Um, <clears throat> there are two ways of solving this, the easy way and a, a little bit harder way. Um, 
I'm going to talk about the harder way first, but we're not going to solve fully using this method because um, that's not our main focus here. So the first method is just to use f equal to ma. Our usual second law of um, motion, Newton's law. And then just, you know, like integrate it or solve this um, using, you know, like kinematics. It's not going to be as simple as what you learn in um, first semester because in this case what happened here is the force on the electron where's my highlighter the force here the force here f is not constant so acceleration is also not constant so that's going to make things a little bit more complicated because we used to the fact that um, you know like acceleration is is constant so that you have like equations that you can use this is not the case this is the case where force is not constant and you see why already because force in this case what force is acting well it's the coulomb force right coulomb force has this form k Q, Q divided by R square. So you can see that it depends on R square. That changes all the time, right? Because initially you are at R1, and then as time passes, you're going to be a little bit less than R1, eventually reaching this value R2. So R changing all the time, right? So force is not constant. So that's going to make mathematics a little bit more complicated. So in principle, this first method is maybe a little bit more intuitive, if you may, but mathematically it's going to be more complicated and we probably want to avoid that. So that's why we're going to use the second method, which is to use um, conservation of energy. And all of this should be quite familiar to you because in the first semester, you also learn conservation of energy. And you saw that in some situation, using Newton's law to calculate it um, is also pretty um, involved in terms of mathematics. So conservation of energy is, in some case, simplify the calculation by a lot. And this is another example that, you know, like, exemplify this um, this concept. So conservation of energy, what does it mean? Well, it means the energy is conserved. But what energy are we talking about here? There are two energies that we need to talk about. First, obviously, is the kinetic energy. And that's the usual one half mv square. So nothing surprising there. But the other one, in first semester, you have potential energy, and usually it's come in the form of mgh. But in this example, we don't have you know gra gravitational um, interaction. Um, I mean, you can say that okay, maybe this guy, which is fixed, also has some mass, so this also has some mass. They might attract each other, but usually the gravitational force is a lot weaker compared to electric force. So we can pretty much ignore any gravitational um, force in the case where there's electric force in the system, like what we have here. So potential energy that we are talking about here is the electric potential energy. Which we're going to write it as EP, as usual. But last time we say electric potential energy, we used the letter U, right? So we can also write that. So what is electric potential energy? Well, we have the formula. And in this case, it's between plus Q and minus small Q. So it's going to be minus, right? Because it's 1 plus and 1 minus. So it's going to be altogether minus K, big Q, small Q, divided by R. 
okay? So um, this is always the signature of potential energy. It's the energy that depends only on your position. So in this case, R. So that's going to be the um, potential energy that we use in this problem. So the way I would do is I would say, OK, this is my, so I just labeling the configuration. So I call this position number one, and I call this position number two. I, I'm going to compare the energy in both cases, and I say they are the same because of conservation of energy. So I'm going to write first. Um, E total, E total at position one. At position one, the electron is not moving. So there's no kinetic energy. But there's potential energy because um, the distance is given by R1. So the potential energy is minus K big Q small Q divided by R1 because that's the distance between the two charges at this point. And that's it. And then I can write E total at point two or position two. Um, the potential energy will be more negative because you are closer. So potential energy reduces. And well, where does that energy go? It goes into kinetic energy, so I have to add one half mv squared. And this m is the mass of this small guy, right? Um, in reality, you probably need to add one half mv squared for the big guy also. But again, remember we say that the big guy is so heavy that we can approximate it to be completely fixed, so we don't need that, okay? but. Just keep in mind that in some situation, you might need to, or in a situation where you allow this one to move also, then you need to add the kinetic energy of the other guy, okay? But in this case, we don't have to. So with this, we say, okay, due to the conservation of energy, so cons of E, that means E total at point one is equal to E total at point two. So substituting what we got, we have minus kqq divided by r1 on the other side. And minus kqq divided by r2 plus 1 half mv squared. Right. So we can solve for the, um, the magnitude of the velocity. Well, what about the direction? The direction should be obvious to you that it's just point into the other guy, right? So we don't need to kind of think too much about that. So by solving this, you have V square equal to KQQ divided by M, and then number two here, one over R2 minus one over R1, like this, okay? So just quickly solve this equation. And you can take the square root if you want, but it doesn't really matter here. And you can see if this makes sense or not, right? Because um, V square should have positive value. Everything in front is positive, but what about the thing in the parentheses? Well, it's 1 over R2 minus 1 over R1, but R2 is less than R1, right? So in this um, parentheses, you are sure to have positive number, so everything should be okay. All right? So essentially, this example says that if you know the potential, you can write down the potential energy, obviously. And once you know the potential energy, then you can calculate you know, like the velocity of the particle in the same way that you did in your first semester. Right, so um, that's why um, the concept of potential energy is kind of very convenient in many cases. So I'm going to talk about the other case where I need to probably go to the next page. So 
So in the second example, and this one will be kind of like an intro to the capacitor that we're going to talk about today. Um, for example, well, not for example, the example that we're going to talk about is this. So we're going to talk about um, the case where we have um, a sheet. Well, there's going to be two sheets of charge, but we're going to put in one first. So we're going to put in the first one which is positive charge. So this is a sheet of plus sigma, okay? So remember what sigma is? This is the charge per area, okay? Charge density plus sigma. This is what we talk about last time when we used Gauss's law to calculate the electric field. So I'm going to quote the um, result. So we, if you have a sheet of positive sigma, charge density of sigma, then electric field is going to point away from this sheet. That's kind of obvious because electric field is always pointing away from positive charge. So above the charge, you're going to have electric field going up, 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 like this. And below, you're going to have electric field going in the downward direction. And last time, we calculated that the magnitude of the electric field is given by E equal to, so magnitude, I'm going to write it this way, just to be complete, sigma divided by 2 epsilon 0. And epsilon 0 is um, a constant. I don't think I say what it's called. It's actually called the permittivity. OK. Which doesn't mean anything, OK? It's kind of like the thing, I don't even know if there's another T here. Let me check. Okay, it's the correct spelling. Um, so it's called a permittivity, and it's just some constant which is related to um, the property of the material. Um, different material will have different permittivity, it's not so important now, but when we talk about capacitor, especially when we talk about dielectric, um, we're going to have um, material which have different permittivity. So um, you're going to have slight um, you know, modification to that. But at this point, you just, again, think of this as um, a constant. OK, anyway. Um, the important thing is that the strength of electric field or the magnitude of the electric field above and below the charge sheet is constant. It doesn't depend on how far away you are from the sheet. Okay? And this is because the sheet is approximately infinitely large. Obviously, if you talk about a very you know, like far away point from the sheet, if your sheet is no longer infinitely large, then the electric field will be not, not like this. Okay, but that kind of require a lot of calculation, and we don't want to think about that now. Um, so this is fine. All right, and then what's the next thing we're gonna do? Well, we're gonna put in another sheet. Another sheet we're gonna put in. It's going to be negative sheet. So I've got to put in negative sheet here. So it's negative here. And we're going to put the same amount of charge, but with opposite sign. So it's a sheet of minus sigma. OK. And you might think, like, OK, why do we need to require that? the upper and the lower charge density has to be 
you know, like the same. You don't have to, but um, you're gonna see like why this kind of makes sense when we talk about capacitor. So let's do that here. Okay, so it's the same sigma but opposite sign. So this negative sheet is gonna have the same strength of electric field but opposite direction. So negative charge, we all know that electric field will point towards that. So I'm gonna write with green vector for electric field related to this negative sheet. So it's gonna point into the negative sheet. So if you are below, then it's gonna point up. If you are above, then you're gonna point down. And you're gonna see something which is, I don't know whether it makes sense in the first glance or not, but here, the electric field from both positive and negative sheet, they point in the same direction. But above the positive sheet, the red one is pointing up, but the green one will point down. Okay, because for the green one, it's above the negative sheet, right? So it has to point down. And the one below, we are missing the red arrows. That's wrong. It has to point down. Like this. Okay, so remember the red arrows are electric fields from the red sheet which is positive so it has to point away from positive sheet it doesn't care whether there's the green one um you know like in front and same for the green one okay so you can see that at the region above and below the sheet the electric field cancel out because they have the same strength the electric field for the green one even though it points at the opposite direction, but the strength or the magnitude, they are the same. So they cancel out. So in other words, if we clean this figure or diagram up, the only thing that survives is the electric field between the sheet. So I can draw it this way for the red one and then green one like this. Why well, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. Okay, so this is negative sigma, this is positive sigma, and the only thing we have left is electric field pointing down in between and nothing above and below the sheet. Okay, I hope you understand why this is the case. So in between the sheet, what's the strength of electric field? Well, you have sigma over to epsilon zero from the positive sheet, and then you have sigma divided by two epsilon zero from the negative one. They point in the same direction. So E total between the sheet is given by sigma over to epsilon plus sigma over to epsilon that equal to sigma over epsilon. Okay, so that's the electric field in between. All right, so once we know electric field, then we can actually calculate quite a few things. So I will do that here. Um, so let's say that we have um, positive charge, which I just put it there. So let's say I have positive charge just beneath the plus sigma sheet, so just beneath the red sheet. So I have this to be plus Q, actually plus Q. And let's say the mass is M. All right. So what's going to happen to this charge? Well, remember that if you have electric field pointing down, 
if and you put some charge there, then that charge gonna feel some kind of electric force. In this case, pointing down. Why? Because F equal to Q times the electric field at that point. And we know electric field is not zero, it's given by this. Okay, so we know the force. And even though we can write electric field to be this value sigma over um, epsilon zero, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna leave it as electric field because it's constant anyway. And if you want, you can substitute in the value later. So we know the force. So what are we gonna calculate here? So let's assume that the distance between the sheet is given by D. Eventually this charge plus Q will reach the bottom and it will reach with some velocity V, right? And that kind of makes sense because the force is pushing it down, right? So it's kind of like falling down under gravity, right? It's gonna get faster and faster. This is very similar. So we want to calculate how fast the velocity is when it reaches the bottom plate, the bottom sheet of minus sigma. So we can calculate that by um, just using the normal kinematics um, equation that you knew from first semester. So force is Q times E. Force is equal to MA, right, Newton's law. So I can write MA equal to Q times E. So acceleration is QE divided by M. So I know the acceleration. I also know that the initial velocity is zero. This is initial velocity, initial V. And I know the distance. I want to know the velocity at you know, the final position. So what kinematic equation that we um, can use to calculate this? So I hope you remember there's this equation V squared equal to U squared plus to a d. So I can substitute in. So I get v square equal to u square is zero because the initial velocity I shows it to be zero. So zero plus two times the acceleration which is qe divided by m and then times the distance d. So the um, velocity or the magnitude of the velocity is just square root of 2QED divided by M. That's the, that's the answer using kinematic equation. <coughs> okay. Did I do something wrong? Well, yes, because I think um, No, I think this is fine. Okay, um, that's fine. So what do we want to do? Well, <coughs> we want to actually think of this in a different way. So it's kind of like the question or the example that we had in the beginning. So we kind of did the first method, which in this example, in the first page, it's not easy to do because force is not constant because one over R square. But in this case, the second example is actually very doable because force is constant because electric field is constant. Right, so it's the same principle. So this is kind of like the first method of calculating the velocity at this point here, right. So that means we have a second method which is related to um, conservation of energy, right? So what's the second method is about? Second method is about introducing the electric potential energy, right? So we can say that the fact that the charge plus Q starts from here and wants to fall down 
is because going down gives you less potential energy. Right? Remember that everything wants to go to lower potential energy. So it should be the same thing here. So what we're going to do is that, well, that probably means this position has more potential energy than this position. Otherwise, it wouldn't have fallen down. Right? So we say, OK, so then we assume that at this position, which is the top plate, let's say it has the potential energy. So actually, I want to draw another picture here. So positive. Okay. So it's the same question, but we're going to say that the top plate has some potential energy U. And the bottom, we're going to say is equal to 0. So let me write it this way. So EP at the top is U. EP at the bottom is 0, like this. <clears throat> so remember, this is positive. This is negative. OK. So the next thing is we're going to redo the calculation, which is if we have the charge plus Q here, mass M, what's the velocity when it hits the bottom? Right. And we're going to use conservation of energy in this case. So I'm going to say, let's call the first position here and the second position here. Well, I don't want to. So maybe I'll do it like this. OK. And I write E total at position 1 to be equal to kinetic energy plus potential energy. But kinetic energy is 0. Initial velocity is 0. So EK is 0 plus potential energy, which is U, like this. Actually, this U here. And E total at position 2, that's going to be potential energy which is 0, right? because we define it to be 0, plus kinetic energy, which is not 0 in this case. So this turned out to be quite simple, because when we say, OK, energy needs to be conserved, so conservation of energy, then we say E total 1 equal to E total 2. So that means u just equal to 1 half mv square. So the velocity or the magnitude of the velocity is just 2u divided by m and 1 half to the power of 1 half. Right. So we got the velocity to be in terms of the potential energy. And the first and second method, they have to give the same answer. Otherwise, um, physics is wrong, right? And we know that they have to give the same answer. So in order for this to be equal to this, it shows what the potential energy should be in this case. Right. So for these two to be equal, then you require that u must be equal to q e times d. Q e d, right? So we can write potential energy in terms of the electric field the distance between the plate or between the sheets and the charge Q itself. So we can do something a little bit more generic in the sense that let's write something which has no reference to the charge Q. Because remember, the charge Q is something that you put in. It's not really 
come it doesn't come with the system right if you replace plus q to some other charge then the potential energy will be different and you can see that you're going to have to change the 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 charge q here so normally we write it in this way so the potential energy u is q times what we call the potential and I put in delta because it's the difference in the potential between the top plate and the bottom plate. In this particular case, we choose the bottom plate to have zero potential energy, but you don't have to, okay? I can replace everything by saying that, okay, let's call this U1, this call is U2, and this is U2, this is U1. So in the end, U here will be just the difference in U, Right, so you have the difference in the potential energy. It's the same as the potential energy that you saw in the previous semester, right? Why you call zero is totally up to you because in the end, what matters is the difference in the potential energy, not the absolute value. So in this case, I just chose the bottom one to be zero because that's more convenient to me. But if you want to be more general, then you have to put delta V here so you can say it's delta or the potential difference potential difference delta v so what we can say is this delta v the potential difference between the top plate and the bottom plate so I go to the next page here so what we got is delta v which is the potential difference between top and bottom plate is equal to, go back here, is equal to E times D. So it's equal to E times D. Remind yourself again what is E and what is D. D is the distance between the plate, between the sheets. E is the strength of the electric field between um, the plate. Okay, so in general, what you're gonna see is a diagram written or drawn like this. So you have the top plate and you have the bottom plate like this. And you're gonna say that the top plate has some potential, okay, not potential energy, potential big V equal to E times D. And the bottom gonna have, oh, I don't want some thick. So V equal to E times D, and then the bottom plate gonna have potential equal to zero, like this. So the top plate has larger potential than the bottom plate. That's why when you put in positive charge, it's just gonna fall down because going down gives you larger, um, uh, not larger, smaller potential energy. Okay, so the potential difference between the top and bottom plate depends on, um, well, usually it's, it's the other way around. Usually um, you, it's a lot easier to specify the potential difference between the two plate because you can do that by you know like connecting a battery or some power source and then the electric field will adjust itself such that this equation is satisfied okay but um, this is kind of like a very indirect way of saying something like this um, remember that we introduced potential energy to um, to kind of like help with the calculation. In terms of physics, there's really nothing new because everything is just governed by Coulomb's force, Coulomb's law or something like that. And this equation shows you that in principle, if you know 
the potential of the system, you can calculate the electric field. And this is true the other way around. If you know the electric field everywhere in the system, you can also calculate the potential everywhere in the system. So they are not independent information. If you know one, you can calculate the other one. But in some case, using um, electric field is easier to calculate, so you use electric field. In some case, using potential is easier to calculate, then you use potential, right? Because in the end, you're going to get the same kind of result. Similar to this, right? So the end result is we want to know what's the velocity here. It doesn't really matter how you calculate it. So you can use the force, which is electric field, in the first method. Or you can use the potential or potential energy in the second method. It doesn't matter. You get the same answer. Right? So which one is easier? It depends on what kind of question we are talking about. OK? So to summarize at this point before we talk about capacitor, um, so <clears throat> uh, maybe I just write it here. So in principle, if we know potential V, we can calculate calculate electric field. On the other hand, if we know electric field, we can also calculate potential like this. OK, so again, E field and potential are not independent information of the system. For a configuration which is very complicated, usually it's a lot easier to calculate the potential. And the reason is very simple. Potential is scalar. Electric field is vector. So it's a lot easier to deal with scalar because you don't need to care about um, you know, direction or anything like that. Okay. But in any case, for us, um, it doesn't really matter which one you use because they are probably equally simple in, in, in terms of mathematics. Um, before I take like a half time break or something like that, um, let me talk a little bit about what we just said. So we have two plates again. And the top plate has potential V. The bottom plate has potential equal to. So the top plate has V. The bottom plate has potential equal to zero. Okay. And I'm not going to talk about the electric field in this case. I just talk about the potential. And if we have the charge plus Q, we know it's going to fall down. Well, actually, I have to talk about electric field. Um, because electric field is pointing down, right? Now, let's talk about what happens if you have not positive charge but negative charge in the system. So the negative charge, if you put it in the middle here, let's say, minus Q, what could have happened to this charge? Well, because electric field is pointing down, the electric force will point up, right? So I don't care about this positive charge. So I'm going to erase it. OK, so the charge here will have force going up. 
remember why this is the case. F equal to charge Q times E. So if Q is negative, then you're going to flip the direction of the electric field. So for negative charge, force is going to point up. So the question that we can ask is this. If we put the negative charge at the bottom of the plate, it's going to fly up, right? Because force is pushing it up. What about in terms of potential energy? Well, it also makes sense in the sense that it's trying to lower the potential energy even though the top has potential V. But remember that potential energy U is Q times V. Since Q is negative, potential energy at the top is actually minus Q times V. But at the bottom, potential is zero, so potential energy is also zero. So you can see that in terms of the direction, it also makes sense here. The negative charge it's trying to go up because by going up, you're going to more negative potential energy. So you're lowering the potential energy, right? So everything kind of makes sense here. So that's, um, again, this kind of emphasize the fact that if you don't want to deal with, you know, like potential energy can be positive or negative, depending on what polarity of charge that you put here, then you just talk about the potential because it makes no reference to what, what kind of charge that you put there. So the potential in the upper, for the upper plane is always V. The potential on, on the bottom plane is always zero, no matter what kind of charge that you put in between, right? But if you talk about potential energy, then it depends on what um, polarity of charge that you put in. Right. So that's why um, most of the time we're going to talk about potential because um, it's just a lot, a little bit more general, not a lot more, but just a little bit more general. Um, and it's sometimes removed, you know, like confusion because you don't need to refer to what kind of charge that you put in. Okay. Um, so this is a good time to take a break. So I will do that and then I'll see you again in 10 minutes.